Hello, everybody. Welcome to an episode of In My Opinion. My name is John. My name is Alesta. And it's your boy, Subash. <laughs> yes, and today we have someone very special with us, okay? So, uh, today we have Subash. Uh... I'm, I was about to blurt out, you know, the you know people people might know who you are, but then for the sake of people who don't, right? Okay, maybe you can give us a little bit of an introduction of what you do, Subash, and uh, help our, our audience understand a little bit better on who you are. Absolutely. So my name is Subash. I'm a I'm a rapper. Um, that's mm. I guess that's the that's that's what I spend most of my time doing. It's uh, I'm I I work in um. Yeah, I, I, I do music. I write a lot. And that's, that's like so many things that we can go off from there. But like mm. the, the core of my work is really just writing and, uh, and storytelling, I guess. Mm, true music, definitely. Absolutely. That's true why we're all, we're all here. Storytellers, but in different mediums. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Mm, today, uh, today's topic. Okay, Alistair, why don't you introduce today's topic? Then we can get Subhas to share a little bit more about, you know, why he's passionate about this topic. Yeah, so today's topic is something that we have been like, kind of putting off doing for a very, very long time already. Like, we have mentioned it at the start. It's like about co- something COVID-related. We never really wanted to do it because we felt like me and John and I, like, don't really have, like, that much expertise on it. We don't really have knowledge beyond, mm. like, the general population. We know what you guys yes. know, but that's not a whole ton. So we just wanted to have a guest that is, like, actually knowledgeable in the area and we actually managed to get Subash here. So that's really, really wonderful. We're talking a little bit more about, like, the migrant worker situation and, um in Singapore, especially this such a big mm. thing in COVID, in, during this COVID period because it was such a, yes. like the home dorm cases and everything really blew up quite a bit. And with that, a lot of social causes that came in with it as well. So, mm. Subash actually, correct me if I'm wrong, but you actually worked quite a bit with the whole migrant worker situation, right? Especially during this period. Um, yeah, I try my, I'm trying my best to support my friends and I are doing as much as we can. What, 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 are some, what are some of the things that you have started with the migrant workers? Um, okay, so I would say first of all, I don't think anybody really is an expert because this is not this is a not a field of study or anything. You know, this is like yes. actual human beings <laughs> in our country who are yes. um, ex- made extremely vulnerable because of policy or the lack thereof, and just in yes. a system of like modern day slavery. But um, mm. but my my work really um. See, it wasn't. I don't even think it's work. I, I don't even call myself an activist or or anything. I just think it's yeah. really. Um, I've been the Little India riots that happened in or oh, riots, as I might say, with air quotes <laughs> in twenty thirteen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It changed my life. It changed my life as a as a as a brown person here living in Singapore. Like it's yes. it reminded me. I think all along I've always known certain things, but to hear like ministers and really people who are taking home like you know money that that migrant workers could make in maybe 10 years of work they make in a in a month you know mm. let's to put things in perspective um mm. to to know that like people you know like the kind of narrative that the media portrayed you know the the walking time bombs narrative that our ministers uh portrayed uh, they kind of like um reveal that's how they feel and so mm. um that was like a very important point i, I know in my own uh, consciousness as a young person and um but i've always always noticed that and then from that point i realized that like hey okay i gotta do something i gotta i want to do something i want to know i mm. want to learn and i want to i i this cannot be this rea- I, I this gaslighted reality that is like our singapore existence um yes. cannot be okay status quo is not okay so i did my um i was in yellow us i did my capstone actually on um on little india and how the uh-huh. securitization of space kind of changed after the the, the 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 what happened in, in little india mm. and then yes. afterwards um i guess from there it's really a parlaying i think every time we do work um that, that we challenge ourselves right to do whatever work whether it's internal or whether it's with communities or whether like whatever work we do we are making a a promise like a this is like a prayer it's like a commitment you know to that we are committed to to continue that work to do more it's not just a mm. one time like uh yeah so for me, whether it's like when I was a kid, my mom was passing migrant workers some like makan, you know, all the time, or um, oh, wow. this my my research, or or after that, like I I made a song with the migrants band Singapore, and uh, we've mm-hmm. always been friends. I've had and I I, I, did, I spent a little bit of time with TWC when I was in school, just doing oh, their nice. cuff road, yeah, their cuff road, like giving out meals and all. That I was a, just yes. very much an ad hoc volunteer, and then yeah. um, and now um, I'm so. I guess everything has coalesced into me and my friends starting a project called Utopia, 
that we are uh, it's a web series so our first episode was on dormitories and uh, we'll continue like there's so many there's the conversation just needs to be uh, so many more people need to be in it and we need to move towards solidarity we can't just stop at awareness uh, it's it's about mm. justice it's about equity um, and uh, yeah and beyond that it's always my music is always going to be like it's not for sale la. my music is just what I feel creating little bookmarks so they're like timestamps in my own uh, understanding of things and in my in, in my own life uh. so yeah that's just how I guess I'm involved yeah I think it's really cool that you're like working so much with like the migrant worker situation even before this whole COVID thing it seems like mm. like a lot of people are like it's like on a kind of on like a microscope right now the whole migrant worker dorm situation yeah. especially because of COVID for those people who don't know what's going on yeah, it's basically yeah. like a whole outbreak of like COVID in the dorm situations also because basically the of, migrant worker dormitory is a super cluster yeah yeah. And yeah, because of that, like a lot of people are paying a lot of attention to it, but it seems like Subhash has been like like really seeing this as a kind of like a problem even before this whole thing came to light. Mm. So like I think the first question that we have to ask you, like a, a bit more like as a starter question, is that I think this kind yeah. of like it stems from a fact that there's a lot of discrimination and a lot of like unhappiness surrounding the whole migrant worker like community in Singapore. And where do you think mm. where do you think that stems from? I think you touched a little bit about like the government portraying a certain like narrative. Is there anything else beyond that? Well, I guess first to 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 what you uh, said a little bit earlier is that um, I guess I don't even think of myself as having done nearly enough work uh, mm. when it comes to this issue. There's so many people that if you great like if anybody has a look at TWC two or Holmes kind of uh, letters like policy paper, uh, I guess. Uh, statement to the media or like their own research work and, and, and you see that this is a problem that has been documented for at over a decade. Nobody has been listening or paying attention. And mm. um well not many. And those who do are not those who are doing this work are not like given IPC status as a charity, for example. Are not like are not sitting at the table with decision makers making those decisions. There's not enough transparency. There's not enough like regulation and legislation in, in this space. Um yes. I don't think there's one specific starting point though. Like I mean, of course, uh, I mean, yeah, there's, there's not like one thing. It's a legacy of how um, really how migrant labor and came into Singapore in the first place. Why yeah. were, were people brought in here, right? This is like a colonial legacy, how people are segregated, you know, uh, yeah. how land is commodified, like which parts of the city uh, are we, like the cities are hotbeds for inequality. And so which part of the yeah. cities are, are more unequal <laughs> than others? And um and even like think about Serangoon Gardens happened a few years back. How they wanted to build yeah. a, a re- residence there, and then people yeah. had a petition and complain. Yeah. Um, it's there is this uh, very bastardized relationship with land in Singapore. Yeah. Okay, yes. Even re- even recently, you look at the, the the new line, the MRT line, that's coming up. I think it's this. What's that? It's not. Uh, what's it? Huh? Cross Island Line. I think it's mm. Trans Island Line or something along those lines. Yeah. yeah, Cross Cross Island Line. Yeah. It was supposed mm-hmm. to, so the residents at like Bishan or whatever, they were complaining that it was, I don't know if it's Bishan, but they were complaining that, oh, it shouldn't skirt McRitchie because it will be like too close to their homes. It should go through the, uh, it should go underground in the forest. It's, I guess it's this whole culture of how at every turn in Singaporean society, uh, it seems that profits prevail over people. Okay. And yeah. And, and 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 the disparity is most obvious with migrant labor. La. I think that it's uh it's been policies that um don't for example, the foreign worker levy, billions has been have been collected by our government, the state. There's no transparency as to where that money goes. You know, and that's collected mm-hmm. from the employers. Employers like some like there's not paying wages has been a huge issue that literally, literally like the workers are by contract supposed to be paid certain things and they have to go through so many hoops to get what is rightfully theirs, you know? Mm. And like where there have been cases or like that my my friends, not cases, my friends have been have tell, told me that like there'll be unpaid salaries for three, four, five months. And, you know, mm. and they can't do anything because um I think Brenda Yo was she's a scholar from NUS, she wrote about how there's a systemic like double silencing of the worker. Number one is that it's just English as the the mode, the language of administration. They 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 can't um, a lot of them cannot navigate that. And then on top of that, you have these policies that make it so difficult for them to navigate between jobs, to complain and report about employers, to complain about yeah. their, their living situations. Everything goes to MOM. So it's not enough independent oversight on the people who are supposed to provide 
um, whether it's housing, whether it's food, like we keep Singapore. I guess Singapore keeps. I, when I say Singapore, I mean um, the leaders are in power, and 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 the leaders in power are not synonymous with government. That's a very important thing. But I guess leadership just um, leadership in Singapore just is 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 has a, a, has has had a history of really like separating these two communities of people. Yes. And I think it's the most obvious now with this local community spread versus migrant community spread. Mm. Yeah. Yes. John, you actually worked mm. a little bit with like migrant workers for a video for the Smart Local, right? I know that's like a, one, yeah, I did. a, a week. Is it a week or a few days thing? A few days. It was a few days. Uh, I actually had the had the interesting opportunity to sleep over at one of their... Uh, it, was, it was not a dorm, but like it was like a shop house that they probably... That was probably rented, you know, to house a few of them, you know. So it was actually a very, very eye-opening experience. And I think something that a lot of Singaporeans uh, do on a daily basis is that it's very easy to uh, dehumanize migrant workers because you do not rub shoulders with them day to day and you do not see what they do day to day. And then you forget that like, hey, you know, just because uh, some of these, like, like for example, the group that I was tagged along with, they were... They were gardeners and uh, uh, basically people who helped to grass cutters and stuff like that. Basically, we, I just blanket statement call them gardeners. But like, uh, b- as a result of their profession, right? You know, a lot of pe- a lot of people neglect the fact that you know these migrant workers are basically and like any other type of worker, and then like, like basically also like any other type of person, you know. And then this is something that like uh, I actually personally experienced, uh when I came back home, you know, and then it was like a little bit problematic for me because I, 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 I mean, personally, I do not share the mindset. But when I came back, right, uh, I encountered the fact that like my, 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 my parents were not exactly very inviting of me because they thought that like I uh, was dirty coming back from a dirty place. I use, I use air quotes because I feel that that's a very backward thinking but at the same time, I don't want to to just out my parents because they're my parents. But it, it made me very disappointed and made me realize that like we are still very far uh, in terms of this uh, culture that we have because it's very unfortunate, you know, that like these people are people and these people also do things for a living. What makes them any different from us? And the project was purely for us to try to bridge that gap. And I come home to something like that, you know. Mm-hmm. So Subhas, when you mention all this, right, I totally agree with you that there is definitely a a major problem but but like at the same time right i feel that very unfortunately i am also not close enough to the problem to actually see a solution you know and i feel that this is so deeply rooted within singaporean society right that it's gonna be so hard to change uh, and i can't see concrete steps you know what i mean it just feels like that that big a problem and that deeply rooted within our culture. And I, I, I want to say that, like, you know, like what you went when you brought up the point about colonialism, I totally agree because I think in in Singaporean society, uh, in Asian society, you know, our, our, our type of Asian society, I feel that there is there is always this very unspoken, uh, unspoken class system kind of thing. And I think this is something that uh, people don't admit. And then as a result of being uh, as in being the majority being coming from a place of privilege, they are also simultaneously blinded by privilege. So it becomes even harder to notice. Mm. You know? And then like add on the extra fact that you mentioned about language barrier, uh centralized uh governmental leadership that makes it harder for people from below to approach on the way up. I I I you know y- that's why we have you on today because I personally don't see any light at the end of this tunnel. We're just trying to make the tunnel a little bit more uh, friendly. But I don't see any light at the end of this tunnel. So, you know, what do you think, you know, uh, are, are some of the things that, that, that like off the top of your head that you can list off, right, that if immediately were changed, let's say overnight tomorrow, right, the situation will improve uh, leaps and bounds, you know? What do you think we can change as a society? Well, I would be dishonest if I told you there's one there's anything that we can do for the situation to change leaps and bounds by tomorrow. But what yeah. I think is that it's very valid. And I think it's 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 true how you feel that that inertia, but that inertia is manufactured a lot of times 
towards mm. creating the creating the apolitical, the model citizen, the one that is unquestioning, mm. the one that reads the benefit of status quo, the one that kowtows and says, thank you, thank you, thank you, I won't ask for any more, I'm very happy, I don't have war, I don't have this, I got clean water, you know what I mean? And similarly, mm. that same thing is like for migrant workers, look at the narrative here, it's really like, Yo, your country, we're really better than your, your other country, wherever you're from, wherever you're from, however, we assume that's mm. where Singapore is the best. There's this Singaporean exceptionalism that must change yeah. from a place of sincerity and humility. I think that one is like the individual, what they can do is really like, we need to start, stop making such big assumptions. These, most migrant workers, right, are middle class migrant workers who can afford to either like have the social networks to, or, 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 or social capital to take loans to pay yeah. agent fees to come here or they may have already have some kind of um, assets or something that they can uh, they sell off or they have some savings that they can pay to come mm. here. So mm. this, these are middle, more, a lot of middle class men because of the economic situation in other spaces and not having work to come here. And so even recently, our Home Affairs Minister said that these migrant workers are very happy to be here. Like, I don't think those generalizations are accurate or fair mm -hmm. and definitely not mm -hmm. representative. When our Minister of Manpower wanted migrant workers to, to ask for, 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 for apology. It, you know, it's crazy that, that um, that's, that's happening when there's no direct access. There's no way that migrant workers can communicate uh, how they're feeling. There's no union or anything like that. And when mm. they do, or if anything happens, it's when, they, when the circuit breaker measure is broken, it becomes a what? Uh, you're deported back to the country. So I think in terms of... But I think here's, here's the thing though, John. Uh, it's very fair it's it's true that the system is designed to make us feel this way but mm -hmm. that is something we need to observe and if we want to move forward with like tangible steps right i think we really first of all need to understand how much space we take up in the conversation if we are about to enter it yeah. so mm -hmm. um because both sides that means look people people from who don't have the red passport to come to our country both sides even the our 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 <laughs> very rich quote-unquote expats also cannot say anything you know, the migrant laborers also cannot say anything because so much, it's so, um, the system is designed and then in the middle, all of us, if we say something, bye, goodbye to even thinking of like um, doing any, getting a job or like having, <laughs> not being persecuted by the state on so many levels. Uh. So I think what we need mm -hmm. to do is, is first and foremost, we need to recognize that, um, that we cannot use that as a debilitate, de de what's that, debilitating kind of like um, inertia like the yeah. first thing we can do I think is like we should in, in terms of the longer or middle to long term we should be advocating for for um, migrant workers to have their own unions that's the most mm. important thing their voice is the most important central um, thing that we need to be focused on and there are mm. leaders in the migrant workers uh, amongst migrant workers so they're not also not a monolith there's female, foreign domestic work, for female domestic workers in homes there's like different industries for male construction workers there are also sex yes. workers who, whose status are so much more transient yeah. and there's just mm. so many so many people that we need uh, people to be able to speak for themselves because then we need, to, we need to be ready to listen and we need to create space so that when people do we're listening and we can actually work in solidarity that's what I mean. Mm. And it must start from a place of care and compassion. So that's like the middle to long term, right? And in the short yes. term, yourself, Alistair, me, we're all uniquely positioned. We have relative privilege. We're all uniquely positioned in a way that um, if we can sit here and have a, have a podcast, right? We definitely <laughs> enjoy a certain amount of privilege in our lives that at yes. least uh, uh, have an ability to articulate how we feel. Yeah. And we must use that voice. We must use that power to, to kind of if, if it's parents, I tell you, like, growing up also, there's certain things that we are that connecting generation, you know, like, we have to code switch in so many ways where we speak yeah. to our parents, where we speak to, you know, so, mm -hmm. so we have to use that power to kind of also, like, bring people into conversation and uh, whether that's, even if it's sitting down at the dining table and having those conversations, um, that's really important because they are your allies. They are the people you see around you. If you're going to do any long-term work, you need that support. You need that common understanding of what you stand for. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I think those things are, um, are for sure and even social media activism it's very individual right um i don't look at it as a negative thing or you know because so much of my work is is online today i'm not on the front lines as more than anybody uh the both of you you know what i mean i'm sitting in my room i'm just trying i'm just dedicating time in my life towards these causes because that's no other better way to use like this most precious thing in my life which is my time so i think mm. that um there are things that we can do right now that will not leaps and bounds change the thing overnight but but I think that narrative is, is 
it creates even more inertia. There's nothing we can do. I think we got to come to terms and be honest with that. But there are small things that we can do and um, those small things should eventually lead to longer term like rights, human rights for migrant workers that uh, they, sh- they should have a say in how that those rights should look like. Yeah. Mm. I definitely agree. Because especially like, I feel like especially during this period of COVID, there's like suddenly an influx of like social issues that are like a bit more apparent because of the whole situation. I think COVID is like a weird equalizer in a way that like suddenly everything that we used to sweep under the rock cannot be swept under the rock anymore. And I think mm. because of not just the whole migrant worker situation, but there are a lot of other things like um domestic abuse or like any other social cause that is right at the forefront right now. I think a lot of people are feeling that what, what Subhash has mentioned about the inertia thing is very difficult to I feel like it's very difficult to be a good person these days. It's very difficult to like try to be a good person, good person because you feel like whatever you do is like not going to amount to anything. And I think that's the biggest problem in a lot of people. They feel like, oh, no matter what I do, it's, this is such a big systemic problem that it's not going to change anything. But I feel like once you switch mm. that mindset to a bit more of a, just talk to your friend about it or like talk to your family about it. Even if it's such a small, small thing, even if you do such a small, small thing, it will still like uh, impact generally the whole like mindset around this these problems and these issues and like while most of the i would say that most of the problems stem from like uh the buck stops like way past us like it's probably like in leadership it's probably in the government but from what mm. we can do i think we just need to like take a step back and just try to reflect and uh be able to talk and articulate like, what articulate our thoughts and our like our messages a bit more upfront yes. to the people with who are like around us especially. Mm-hmm. So like going along those lines, yeah. Going along those lines, can I just ask um where do you feel like the government has been doing enough? So I feel like the buck stops like way definitely not at us. It stops at the government or like the people in leadership. So do you think they have been doing mm-hmm. enough and do you, and what more should be done, especially once COVID is over? Because this thing is gonna be a problem even without COVID. Yes. Right. I mean, I would say, what has the government been doing? The government has doing the bare minimum, expecting like, you know, and backpatting themselves for doing the bare minimum. They have not. It's been government failure. It's been um, it's been on a and it's a it's a humanitarian crisis that we're in. The the I think that like the Ministry of Manpower has been doing the bare minimum and then weaponizing the the the, the frontline workers and you know saying like oh we're doing our best and all that. When this problem was already like something that for for like <laughs> at least a month, other people have been saying, "Yo, you need to check out dorms. You need to reduce density now, 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 now." Now was not done. Even after the first case at Leo Dormitory, there was more opportunities for more things to be done. Uh, houses were sitting from two thousand eighteen. There was a housing estate that was empty after on block that they eventually moved essential workers to. There are so many other places in Singapore that they could have moved people. Instead, people were at car parks. People were like. Uh, move then and there was these like glamour like you know like amazing like, oh we're moving up to floating dorms and all that bullshit when really like you know this was government failure the state has so it's to, maybe to the state they are doing enough yeah the bare minimum just enough for me the state has wholly failed even in this pandemic they've failed and even right now as, as we re, as we are about to reopen a country in phases or whatever like um look what look what's happening these are not numbers and it's not it's so simple we just throw around oh the numbers should come down from the hundred high like close to a thousand to the hundreds like this means every one more worker who has to lie to their family about how their health because they don't want to worry about their family this means one more worker who is literally living waiting to test positive as part of our herd immunity like strategy for migrant workers the state has not done enough. The state needs to then and but here's my my worry because the answers don't lie with them. The answers don't lie up. They're not up. The answers lie here. The answers lie here. And I think where what's important is like, you know, maybe maybe one thing that our, our city is very hostile, in my opinion. Whether it's from mm-hmm. its architecture to its policy, like it's a hostile place to stay in Singapore. And I think what's the most violent thing that someone can do is it goes back to this idea of Asian values just now we talk about it, right? I think when yes. we think Asian when we think Asian values, right, a lot of time, right, that 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 um I guess not prototype, what's the the so I word for it? Not stereotypical also. I guess that that one Asian value we think in our mind, right, is in Singapore when we say that people usually mean Chinese values. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Of like filiopathy or Confucianism, a lot of times that default mm-hmm. Asian, right? is one type of Asian in Singapore. Mm-hmm. And I think yes. the truth is, right, from whether it's your histories or my histories, right, um, okay, 
got. Um, sorry, I was just checking the the, the clock to make sure that we did, I didn't oh, lose no the recording. Um, when we think of Asian values, right, I think we must also, first of all, know our histories. We must know where we are from. We must know the stories of the people who have come before us. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. In a way that is not just from our social studies textbook. In a way that actually recognizes the resilience of, uh, of us, of our, our parents, our grandparents, where they are from. Who are we? What are we diaspora of? So often we think of ourselves as Singaporean without interrogating what the, the politics of saying that means. And so once we mm-hmm. figure out that, that lineage, once we figure out whatever is inside our DNA as, as a memory of intergenerational memory, right? I think we'll realize mm-hmm. that it is not within our Asian values to be subservient or to be <laughs> or to be unquestioning or to be conformist, maybe. Maybe, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe in some parts, yeah, sure. Right? If it depends who you are using the yardstick as. But for me, I think within our Asian values is also standing for what's right, standing our and, and also championing for each other and being mm-hmm. a community of people. You know what I mean? And and um and it's inherently powerful to do that. So I think first of all, if we can do that work and understand that, right, then we we'll realize that hey, it's only been uh 50, 60 years that <laughs> Singapore has had this more, I guess, uh modernization project or its independence yeah. these laws that we, we we think are like you know like we've been born into or that we've been gaslighted to believe as hey this is the way it is and it will be forever has led to also part of that inertia that we don't mm. feel like anything can change look micro workers policies re- like the way that dorms are were only built probably like they were only kind of like we went into these purpose-built dormitories and all that i think only from the 70s 80s so it's like we're talking about a history of maybe 40 years and with, and and we, we really and then how is the next 40 years going to be look, looking like that's probably just the bulk of our lifetime so so once we realize that right then we realize okay i got 40 years you got 40 years you got 40 years for example uh, and if we take all that amount of work to put towards this right we can change things but i think too often people like um i guess have deferred that power to like oh it's not i'm not getting paid to do this Nobody's getting paid. I've never been paid a cent for like this kind of things. But I think it's really mm-hmm. where we derive value in life. And so mm. I don't really look to like the state to, to have these answers. I think mutual aid networks are really important. You know, if we can directly help or do something. And I think we have to stay connected. Look at the amazing work that like people like Koki, she's a she's an activist and, and writer, and Kirsten, who's a journalist, and Jolivan, mm. who's today, today was uh was basically given like a uh, instructions not uh, was asked to be to, to come down to the police station for for holding a sign that had a smiley face you know mm-hmm. to the ceilings of the world to the to the priyas of the world these amazing artists and who who are really um i guess really challenging that and really saying no this is this is um this is not the only story this is not the only narrative and i think so long as we stay connected there I don't have the answers individually, but if we keep questioning, we'll get to better questions and hopefully get to some some sort of justice, some some better standard mm. of that for, for people. I think the whole activism thing, especially in Singapore, is like a very uh is a rather um controversial topic, especially for like normal, like I would say general population folk like me and John who are we are not really activists per se. There's not really yeah. uh, anything that we feel so strongly for that we want to fight for other than maybe mental health issues for myself. Uh. But other than that, I would say Mm-mm. pretty much everything is like, we are like, we represent pretty much the general population in this case. So I think that yeah. the whole activism thing, um, I feel like it's a bit of a, do you feel like it's a little bit of a problem if like the activism is so uh, out there that the people from us, like the general population will not be able to relate to it? How like mm. how important do you feel like? Actually, I just want to say that I don't, I don't, I really don't think that it's too out there. Okay. It's just that like uh, the thing about it is that I feel that in 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 Singapore, right, especially for majority of the population, people people have this uh have this mindset of like I I do not know if it's because of all the years and uh, and 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 how the country has become. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's about activism or like top or like uh causes being too out there for the layman Singaporean or, or, or the general population. It, I just feel that, you know, this this general population in Singapore, are, we, we are very forgetful people. And like, uh, you brought about, uh, Subhash just now mentioned about the, the history of Singapore not being too long. Yeah, in fact, we are an extremely young country, right? But yeah. for an extremely young country, right, we are surprisingly forgetful about how, how we, where we came from and how, how everything became where it is and how 
much has changed since then. And like if you put into comparison the amount of time he mentioned, how much can be changed in that equal amount of time. And I think that is the bigger that is one of the bigger issues about trying to uh advocate for social change and that like Singaporeans cannot comprehend certain types of scale. And because of that, right, mm. we are not able to like put into action. Like for example, if we pushed as hard to end the Japanese occupation with that same amount of effort we pushed to to bring uh uh, justice for our migrant workers, right? I believe the change will come uh, relatively quickly. But like the issue is, right, uh, I feel that as a country, we are all very comfortable right now, which gives us even more incentive to be forgetful and to, and to you know, buy into the status quo like, like Shubhas mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. So like, I feel like, you know, this is not an issue of the cost being too out there anymore. Okay. It just feels like Singapore as a country, we have, we have too many good things to the point that we don't know how to be problem solvers anymore for certain things. You know what I mean? <laughs> you, you get where I'm coming from? But I think those are these are two separate but, but intersecting ideas, yeah. right? I think first and foremost, convenience is the enemy of progress. When you can mm-hmm. take care of that, I guess, the, the basic needs of people and then you can throw at them certain distractions, you know, like... Uh, like whether it's a salacious headline or the media, you know, whether it's like, um, yes. or, or, or gambling or Singapore pools. All these things are, 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 if you think about it, right, it's to keep people distracted, it's to keep money away from, from people <laughs> and it's also to keep, um, I guess, to keep people apolitical. The truth is, yes. I don't think, so I think first, first on John's point, right, I think that um, even sports, sports also has that function in society. Whether, whether yes. we, I mean, I'm a huge sports fan as a Liverpool like this right there. <laughs> but, uh, but then, so, but first, I guess, you see, I think it's where we place the, the focus here because I don't yes. think it's the individual. I don't ever think that it's the, the individual forgetting. Instead, I look at it as how larger systems like the education system, mm-hmm. um, like, I guess, um, just even the, the media, the news and how they portray certain things to how we celebrate yeah. things as a nation. Like, look at our National Day Parades, look at the Bicentennial, whatever bullshit that is. Yes. Like, look at where that focus is. It's on a specific narrative. It's on a specific narrative of exceptionalism, of, of prosperity, of first wellness, you know? But it's very... And so I think, I don't ever think it's the people are forgetting. It's that some people never knew. Some people never knew because those stories don't exist. Yes. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. So, I really think that it's it's a bit harder to find. I will tell you in Singapore, like only recently, you know, only recently am I, I, I I've been like really asking my sitting around my mom and asking her a lot of questions about where she's from and I and and where like her family's from. You know, those are important questions mm. because it, it it leads to an our identity, and I think that um, I I don't place I just don't place the focus on the individual. I always look at the individual as like someone who has infinite power, someone who has inalienable rights, but yes. I never would like I never want we should never hold it against someone like hey how come you like that like that like that so I think yeah. that's, that, yeah. that this is always a let me let's invite each other to look at that and to start mm-hmm. to, 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 to ask mm-hmm. a few questions because when we really dig right what we'll realize is that actually this system is not just doesn't doesn't just uh, dehumanize and and um, hurt by migrant workers it's yeah. just that we are cogs in the machine that I will have a bit more value economically you know it's so I think like we, we, we will start to realize that hey when we don't have a minimum wage in a country everybody suffers mm-hmm. our cardboard collectors our aunties working at McDonald's everybody suffers yeah. without a minimum wage um, yes. and so so I think really it's just a it's we it's a it's a consideration of scale not just in terms of scales of change but also in terms of how we where we place responsibility to the issue like it is intentional that we only have one way of how a young person learns in Singapore you yeah. know what I mean? And mm-hmm. I guess we can always take the government narratives like the, the guarantee of public education you must do like 10 or 12 years which is mandatory. Some people like, who, who've never been in it will say like, oh wow, Singapore, best education system, they make everybody go to school. On the ground, what that means is you have complete control over the narrative for generations of people. Mm-hmm. HDB, uh, ethnic integration policy. It's very easy to say, oh my God, multiculturalism. <laughs> but the truth is that you are, that now there's a, there's a Chinese majority in every space in Singapore, right? And that, that, um, that how you call it, gerrymandering doesn't happen like this. It happens like up in Singapore. And so it's just like, mm. there's many different things like that. And even like the narratives around NS, it's all like to keep people like trapped. It's never been about like people investigating, being curious, being free. So I think that's where, for me, um, 
I think it's it's more useful just to, to to for us to also look at the larger systems that really lead to the individual being the way they are and being that inertia is something that it's it takes time to overcome. But I think it starts with being curious about who we are and uh, mm-hmm. what we can do and what what we have done. Um, our parents. I always tell my friends, our parents were in like a survival mode, <laughs> you know, and and yes. uh, we are in a different. It's a different kind of survival for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. you Absolutely. know. But um, I guess back on uh, Alistair's question, right, or like about the relatability, right? I think it's very tricky because we could go into this space of like tone policing, you know, when someone okay. like for example, for example, like came with a Sami video last year. Um. Mm-hmm. I think what happens is the danger when we let the slippery slope be only drawn one way by 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 one actor, you know. So it's like okay. the narrative of coming out of that was like if we let this video, we'll let hundreds of other videos to come out, and you know, like what well, we must deter and we must do all these things. But I think it has never seen from the other side. I think so many times the people who are voicing out things right they don't get hurt and people are just not listening and and it's really um, difficult because it's not just about like me or what happened last year. This is really yeah. about so many other people like queer folk in Singapore who have been who have been at every turn at least I mean I'm on I'm on Twitter now and so like I'm reading so much and I'm just like whoa is it just like uh, we're just going to let people say what they want but if it gets a little bit too popular or it gets a little too viral we're going to step in and we're going to have a more than proportionate response and we're going to like make sure yeah. that these uh, you know and then we're going to use them as an example so nobody ever speaks up it's really um, I, I think it's very difficult because people are angry and, and I'm angry a lot of times but I don't I'm just a like a chill guy like, I just make some jokes life is <laughs> life is a joke you know it's to be life is like we're cursed la, to be here. Yeah. <laughs> it's a give and a curse, you know? It's a give and a curse. Mm-hmm. So I think for me, I just try to have as much fun as I can in this life by doing important work. But um, I also think that it's really about the trust we build with people, you know? Yes. And I think even so for me, I don't think as myself of myself as like someone who, um, who I'm always going to advocate and, and my the way I do things is that I want more people in the conversation. Like it must be open ended enough that I can that we have because it's not about me. The ego is away from this. But very crucially, I think when people uh if something doesn't relate, right? If someone's saying something's wrong in a country and it doesn't relate to some other person, I think it really the question is not how can the person make something more relevant or relatable to that person. I think the question should be like, how can I live in this same small space and my reality being so different from someone else? I think the the, the owner shouldn't the the burden shouldn't be on the person who may feel wronged, you know. And this is not mm. just about like race issues or like anything, you know. The owner shouldn't yes. be on the person who feels wrong. I think the owner should be on us to 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 listen when someone is saying something and and and, yes. and self interrogate and be self reflective and 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 dismantle any privilege that we might bring into a conversation. And then if mm-hmm. we we don't understand something. I think that the intention behind that question asking is is different already. Instead of like, yo, like, what are you doing? Like this, it doesn't only work, it just doesn't work for you. Like you know, chill. <laughs> I think that's the most uh, unproductive way that we can uh, relate to each other. I think uh, this whole tone policing thing and like activism is like a whole other topic by itself. So uh, I mean, it could go on like like really another whole episode about this, but let's try to bring it back a little bit towards the migrant worker situation in Singapore mm-hmm. since like here's, here's what Subash is here for. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, yeah. why don't we try to like uh, end off in like a little bit more positive note? Uh, or, I mean, you don't, you don't have to be positive, but uh, I think this is a, a question that is, <laughs> has, a, has an opportunity to be positive. Do you feel like the situation will improve okay. once COVID is over? Do you think there will be yeah, are you hopeful for change in the future, especially with our generation? Actually, maybe people? the question let's tweak let's tweak it a little bit. So, how do yeah. you think the situation will change for for migrant workers? Firstly, mm. and secondly, right? How do you think the situation will change for Singaporeans when they think of migrant workers because of mm. this entire COVID in the situation? You know, how do you think this is going to change? What's going to happen next? Um. So I think our state is very. Um, to me, they are disaster capitalists. Look at how much uh, totalitarian policy came out of the the Little India, uh, what the situation in Little India in twenty thirteen. Okay. There's a whole country wide alcohol ban <laughs> after ten thirty came out of that. Mm-hmm. So um, I think we have to be very careful here about the policy. I think we need to really have leadership that has a mediated approach 
in how we instill policy. And then the policy that gets set here, right, it needs to be time specific. Because after that, mm. like, like you kind of use this as a way to like to, 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 to put in policy that stays throughout and then we live in a even more surveil a more authoritative state you know so i think mm-hmm. uh, that's something that i think we, we just need to keep our eyes peeled for um mm. and we're really starting to see some of these policies because we don't see you and i don't like they don't like release publicly release these or have like live parliamentary debates and all that so we don't really see or hear these things so we just gotta notice them uh, as much as we can dig but i think the situation in terms of public awareness i don't think they'll, they'll ever be the same i think this is it's good this is positive a lot mm. of people the fact that you all want to dedicate uh, one whole podcast to talk about this issue is testament to that. Like, mm. like this was not in the, I guess in the in the in the view of some people. Not saying not 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 you all, but I mean like for some people at all, right? They never had to yes. think or talk about migrant workers, and now mm. every day the government is SMSing us with migrant workers. How many people? How many this? How many that? Yes. Every day the news has to cover it. So, um, and and we're holding ministers accountable, like what Jacob Ibrahim said. Like you know, the it took a virus to clear the migrant workers from the field. A minister said that in Singapore. You know? I saw I saw that that, that was that was <laughs> terrible. Yes. Yeah, and, and a lot of people um had, had, you know, I think public consciousness and also like um us actually saying, hey, no, fuck that. Like this is not okay. Mm. Is uh that that's hopefully mm. I'm I'm actually very sure that that's just changed because I feel it. Right. Mm. And uh moving forward, but that needs to be leading to something. That needs to be leading towards like uh, our voting decisions. You know, that needs to yeah. be leading towards like the things that we ask um, or not ask, but demand, you know, when we are sitting in front of like policy or uh, the opportunity mm. to make change. And at, even in our, in our workplaces, sometimes we have the opportunity to make change. Let's ask the question, what about like migrant workers? How may, they, how may they be affected by this? Can we have a migrant worker in the room making that decision that affects their lives? You know, those kind of questions. Uh, so in, from that end, I think it's, it's really, really good. And, and it is positive, but I hope I, 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 it's, it's that's weird to say because it li- literally there are migrant workers who have lost their lives. Um, um, of course, it's not reported as COVID related, but the migrant workers have lost their life in the last like three weeks and a month, you know, and that it took thousands of people now who are suffering from the coronavirus. So I shouldn't take that for people to feel this. But if we were gonna take positives, then I would just say that yeah, this is one big thing that now people that will never talk about migrant workers the same again. Because yes. there are a community in Singapore who have been through one of the worst times, you know, in in our in my lifetime, as to see. Uh, but when you talk about like government and policy, <sighs> Josephine Teo gave us her word. You know, she did say, you know, we you have my word. <laughs> but she still she still I mean, there is um. I, I guess what's really gonna happen is we we have also to be careful that in I think the media has the big a very very big role to play here in mm. even that Lian He Zhao Pao and in a country that doesn't have freedom of press uh, we must hold accountable to mainstream media sources and how they report about issues or how they talk about migrant workers you know what I'm saying mm-hmm. so I feel like um, I, I would hope I don't think that's going to change I think it's too deeply insidiously kind of like entrenched uh, the, 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 mm. the very xenophobic and and racist ways of like certain certain folk mm. and certain like institutions, yeah. Yeah. but um, that being said, I think that that's we have to hold them accountable. So I I, I think policy wise, it there there could be things that come in. I I don't know. I don't, I don't like to speculate about that. But I just know that um, in terms of the public awareness and visibility of the work that people like TWC two home yes. uh, these groups are doing, it's it's also changed. Like so many people know now and want to do something. So let's take and and people look at the fundraiser, for example, the one that yeah. like um you Utop- even the one that Utopia and Pretty mm. we put together and so many other people. It's been millions of dollars that people have just donated. Mm. So I people want to help. People can help. Mm. And I think now it's about like um really Getting people and continuing these conversations, we move forward. I think I think it's great that now think now now this now, I mean it's great that now this this group is a lot more visible and like how you mentioned, it is also very great news that uh a lot of people seem interested to to want good things and to help and and I think that's definitely a step forward from from pre COVID nineteen times and uh like what you mentioned you know we don't want to speculate and then we definitely cannot see too far into the future as well. <laughs> so we can't really quite see how far, how this thing will develop. But definitely right now, what we're seeing is at least there is some positive development. Actually, if I can, maybe not, I won't say speculate, but what I 
mm. a trend. I think that we will we okay la, speculate and speculate lah. Uh, <laughs> it's it's I think, I think what's gonna happen is probably a lot of workers are gonna lose their jobs after this okay. because okay. Yeah. um because of a lot of them are now like you know the first part there was a press release MOH and MOM you know joint forces and then they said that oh they will be using um paid hospitalization leave, but a lot of employers right now that's that's changed they're saying they're getting workers to either sign something or commit to something where they say that oh this is unpaid hospitalization leave that means they lose their leave days and if that's already lost that means it's unpaid basically this time away is unpaid what happens if there's so many questions and nuances what if someone recovers from the virus what happens next Mm. you know what if someone is like extended and then like suffers from the virus for a very long time what happens next like what if uh, a contract ends like a, a work contract ends and someone is still like has the virus and it's something that there's a demise or something like that someone passes on what insurance covers a lot of these things are i i so what i think is that there's a lot of stress now because of the uncertainty uh and i i think that a lot of workers are going to be laid off uh are going to just be fired after this because either they're cutting costs or whatever or they're going to sign some contracts that they are they they, 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 they can't stay on but the pay is going to be lousy so the number one thing I feel like is that MOM has to protect these workers in the way that like they they have to be making they have to be have close scrutiny with these employers you know and all these decisions that come out of the pandemic because coming out of the pandemic could be the rest of the year so I think that a lot of mm. workers are going to lose their jobs and what if they lose their jobs and they don't have their home what if their situations in their home country doesn't allow them to travel so those things are things that we we got to be thinking with nuance we cannot just say like okay, thought about it, like, you know, big picture, nothing's going to change. I think, like, we really, let's ha- operate from empathy, operate from education and information and just be asking those logical next questions. Like, if mm-hmm. those were our friends, if, if my friend was, my friends are in that situation, but we just have to ask ourselves, you know, if my friend or my brother or my sister is there, like, in a situation that was that was, that was uh, managed by these policies, how could they, like, be thinking, How what, what could be happening? <laughs> that, mm-hmm. that What are the blind spots? So, yeah, mm-hmm. there's positives that come out of this, but there's a whole lot of like questions that I also have out this. Mm. I think like the biggest takeaway for like people watching at home is if you don't have like if you're not in a position where you can help um or like you feel like you don't really want to donate money, I feel like the biggest thing is just try to find out more, like be empathetic towards these people like situation. I think that's like the bare minimum yes. that we can do as like human beings, you know, like yeah. beyond the whole right. Singaporean thing, beyond think, the whole I- race thing. Mm, yeah, I think the worst thing that 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 we can do right now and would would be to ignore. And mm. uh, I think you know, uh, as as a viewer viewer, if you're watching this and if if this is something that you didn't even think was a problem, right? I would say the bare minimum you can try to start to do is to try to pay attention and see where you can contribute because definitely, uh, society is changing very quickly. I don't know if you noticed, but we are changing really quickly. And uh, this is something that like, we will definitely have to address, especially now since COVID-19 has exposed this gigantic loophole in, in our system to us. And uh, we will not be doing our, our migrant worker friends justice by ignoring it as Singaporeans. Agreed. I think that's a nice way to end it, right? For here? Yeah, so uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us today, Subash. I think it's been a great, it's been great having this conversation with you. Thank you so much for letting us know, you know, find out a little bit more about this, uh, this, this cause that you are so deeply rooted in. I feel that a lot more, pe- a lot more people can go through this conversation. You know, it's truly been educational, and I think I hope you know this, this podcast and this message reach, reaches the right people. And uh, yeah, you know, like I mentioned just now, right, to our viewers, you know. Take action. You know, there are so many things that you can do. And I, I firmly believe that if you don't know what to do, you just need to go and ask Dr. Google. They will have all the other all the options that you can try to try to begin with. Yep. Thank you guys so much for watching. See you in the next one. Peace. Bye.